Hi, it's Jonathan. What I want to do today is expand upon some concepts that I've put out there for people so that there's a little bit better of an understanding behind what I'm trying to relate to you. Number one question, why am I drawing upon the teachings of Christ? If I never met the guy and I don't know if he existed, right, why would I do that? I never did meet him. I don't know, you know, what really happened as far as a detailed written down history. So why do I pull from it? Why am I talking about him? Based upon what I am learning individually. You see, I was protected from religion in the Bible. I never read it. You know, maybe read the first page of <laughs> the Old Testament and it disgusted me so much that I put the whole thing down. I've heard catchphrases put out there, you know, throughout the media and, and whatever Christ was supposedly teaching and all that. But I was protected from it through the synchronicity of reality. Based upon what I am taught in the woods and just in life in general, the more that I'm taught, the more that I'm learning, the more I understand what Christ was saying. I mean, from the ground up, I may say it differently, but I understand it. And I'm not saying that I have a belief system that I understand it, because I know there are a lot of people that are like, yeah, I understand it too. That's not what I mean. I mean, I truly understand it. So, one thing I know is that somebody knew. Somebody, at some time, knew what I'm learning better than I know it. And you can only know that when you know it. You see, I don't know if the name is Jesus. My instinct says that's a deity used to possess people. Do you accept Jesus in your heart and then that's a willing contract because you aren't uh, aware enough to question who Jesus was. See, phonetic symbols have meaning. If his name wasn't Jesus, screw the translation. You're letting Jesus in your heart. A name. Do you understand the significance of that? You're letting a name identifying a personality. I don't care what they conned you into believing. Jesus means this and that. It means the, you know, whatever. Forget that. You're also told the Statue of Liberty means freedom. Anyway, somebody at some time knew. And how do I know this person was connected to creation? Well, from what I'm learning. Somebody knew the correct way to perceive this reality. Somebody knew what it was and how to handle it, how to overcome it. Somebody did. I know the Illuminati didn't come up with a lot of those parables. They couldn't have, because if they could, meaning they had the understanding, the knowledge that builds the foundation reaching the conclusion in these parables, if they knew that, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing right now. Let me say that again. If these people that created religion knew and understood the meaning behind those parables, they would not be doing what they're doing right now. Therefore, I know that somebody knew outside of this control system. What the name was, I don't know. Based upon what I know from spirit, whoever gave those parables would never be concerned with being anointed or being called the Christ. So, by deduction, based upon what I know, the man existed. I can only infer that they stole the teachings of this man to sell this pagan worship of Satan. What is Satan? Satan's a consciousness. Satan is neither male nor female. It's both. If you watch the movie The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson nailed the essence of Satan with Satan's appearance that seemed in a bizarre way neither male nor female, but strangely attractive. That character, the hooded character, 
very mysterious, very logical, very sensual. In other words, it exhibited both male and female characteristics. I don't mean like a gay man would. I mean in a very mysterious, sensual, intelligent way. That's what you're dealing with. So it will be male to those who want to perceive it as male and female to those who want to perceive it as female. It is neither, and it is both. Here's the problem with the Bible. Think of riding a bike. Imagine writing a book about riding a bike. You lay it all out, a really thick book, telling you the nature of the bike and how to ride it, how to balance what the bike is, what you should do, where you can go, how to properly ride a bike. And you give this to people, and they've never ridden a bike, but you make them memorize the book, forwards and backwards. There's thousands of pages in the book about riding a bike. And they all memorize it real well. Imagine also in this book that the people who wrote it did not want you to ride a bike. So because they don't want you to ride the bike, they have to be the authors of a book on how to ride it. Does that make sense? I mean, logically, that would be the strategy, would it not? If you want to control people and keep them from being able to ride a bike, then you have to be the one in charge of all the information about the bike and all the instructions on how to ride it. So what you're going to do is you're going to mess it up. Imagine adding things in like to properly ride the bike, you have to make sure that you lean all the way to the left. And remember, you're not good enough to ride the bike. You don't really deserve to ride the bike. And the bike is angry with you, and you're going to have to beg the bike for mercy. And the odds that you're going to be able to do it successfully are almost nil. But memorize the book anyway. And you have all kinds of contradictions in this book. But the people can't argue with the contradictions because they've never ridden a bike. And then say somebody comes along who's ridden a bike. And this person goes up to somebody who's memorized a book on riding a bike, but has never ridden one. And you get into a conversation about the bike. Now you've ridden one, it's natural to you. But this person has been forced to memorize a book with fear and shame and guilt about the whole thing on how to ride a bike, but they've never done it. I guarantee you that you would get into an argument. It would probably go something like this. Here, let me take a look at your book. I've ridden a bike, let me just take a look at it. You start reading through the book, and you're like, whoa, 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 hang on a second. And they say, what? You say, what? What is this? Lean all the way to the left? Sir, you would fall if you did that. No, 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 I know, I memorized that, that's, that's chapter 3, paragraph 9. You have, must lean all the way to the left in order to successfully ride the bike. Sir, that's crazy. You'll fall. No, no, you're evil, this is the word of the bike, the bike wrote this, and this is its word, and it says it to ride it, it knows, and it used to lean to the left. Sir, I guarantee you the bike didn't write this. Here, look. C c look at this other chapter. Let me show you something. You see in this chapter how it talks about 90 degree angles? How it would be better to be positioned in a 90 degree angle? On and now look over here. It says lean to the left. Didn't you notice that contradiction? It's the word of the bike. It knows. It understands its own contradiction. What? Sir, I've ridden a bike. I don't know what's going on here, but I can tell you that whoever wrote this book does not want you to be able to ride a bike. And this big, heated, emotional argument ensues. Now, had you never ridden a bike, you wouldn't be able to look at that book and know what the lies are. It would be impossible for you to tell. So you say to the person, hey, look, look, here's a bike over here. 
You see? Yeah, they exist. You don't need to read about them. They exist. They've just been hiding them from you. This is a real bike right here. Here, get on. No, no, no. Just trust me. Get on the bike here. Put your legs over. And then you give them a push. And they try to ride. And they lean all the way to the left. And they fall. And now they're scared. The bike hates me. It, I'm, I, I must repent. No, 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 no. Sir, you're copying the book, and the book doesn't want you to know how to ride the bike. The bike wrote this but Listen, just try it again. You put them on the bike, give them a little push, and they fall again. You say, watch me, and you get on the bike, and you're riding all over the place. And so now that they see you riding the bike, you've got their attention. You've got their attention because they've been reading about a bike and how to ride it their whole lives. And they can't understand why they can't ride it and you can. Maybe they think there's something wrong with them or something wrong with you. Well, that's not a real bike then. Yes, sir, it is. It's a real bike. Just try it again. So you put them on the bike and you say, let go of the book. Trust yourself. Listen, you won't believe this, but you were designed to ride that bike. That's your very design. And the book is keeping you from knowing that you naturally know how to ride it. Forget the rigidity of this book. Trust your instinct and try it again. So you put them on this bike and they make it 20 feet before they fall. Oh my God, I did it, that was fun. Yeah, that's your design. Do you know that as a bike rider, that's what you enjoy the most? Did you feel controlled when you were riding that bike or did you feel more free than you've ever felt in your life? And now, of course, the authors of the book and the people that promote the book get pretty angry when they find out about this. You're blowing their whole scam out of the water. That's no good to them, right? Because you see evidence of the bike around, but you've never ridden one, they need to create that book to include the evidence, but tear you away from it at the same time. Well, this is a metaphor, of course, and I can tell you something about Christ. He was a bike rider, and he rode the bike. And he was trying to get all of you to ride the bike. Instead, they're trying to get you to ride him. Understand my meaning. He was a bike rider, trying to get everybody else who were naturally bike riders to ride the bike. And now they're trying to get you to ride him. Let me ask you something. Did Christ feel like he needed to wear a specific outfit in order to be credible? Oh, that's right. No, he didn't. What book was this man regurgitating from? Oh, that's right. No book. He didn't need a book about riding bikes because he already knew how to do it. They're giving it a name and a procedure and a ritual called Christianity. What name did he give it? Oh, that's right. No name. You see, in the Bible, they even tell you, watch out for people who give long, extended sermons for praise and their outer persona. It's right in there. But with mind control, which is what religion is, people cannot allow themselves to see the direct contradictions. I mean, the Old Testament is absolute crap. 
It's pure mind control. I mean, come on, man. Uh, the shelf, uh, the table was three cubits high and two cubits wide. And that, that, it's all sacred geometry. It's crap. What does that have to do, descriptions like that, and family lineage have to do with the spirit? Not one thing. Not one. It's all channeled. The parables, you have to understand that the knowledge he had is non-translatable. In other words, if you read a book about riding a bike, you can read it all you want. You can memorize it forwards and backwards and dedicate your life to that book. Someone puts you on a bike, you're going to fall. Period. Reading a book about riding a bike is not the same as intuitively riding a bike. And they know that. They know that all too well, you see, because Satan controls religion. And it loves it. It loves that you're memorizing this book on how to ride a bike. Do you understand? That's Satan's preference. It prefers that because at the right moment, for everybody who's memorized that book about riding bikes, Satan will put you on that bike and you're going to fall in the crucial time because you've depended upon a fraudulent book about bike riding when the irony is you're naturally a bike rider it's like a, a coach we've all seen this where you have a player with natural talent on some sports team and you get some bullshit coach that comes and tries to force the player with natural ability to follow his structure the coach can't play, the coach doesn't have one ounce of the natural ability of the player, but yet the coach with his position of authority over the player forces the player to acclimate to his philosophy based upon no talent whatsoever, and then the player screws up. The player becomes mechanical and rigid and can't perform the same way. Parables are metaphors, okay, and they're meant to draw upon some sort of experience you've had to tune your mind to an understanding outside of descriptive words. For example, um, it's kind of like if I went up to a basketball team and I said to the players, guys, it's like the feeling you get when you spin a basketball on your finger. You know, the feeling that you get when it's stabilized and you just got it, you just know it, you, you've got it going, that type of feeling. And the ones who can spit a basketball on their fingers say, yeah, yeah, I get that. Makes sense why I've drawn upon a feeling that you cannot translate into words. I cannot describe it with words. I can attempt to do so, but it's not the same thing as accomplishing spinning a ball on your finger. It's one thing to talk about it, it's another thing to do it. They say, yeah, I get that. Of course they get it because they've done it, therefore the parable has meaning. If they haven't done it, it will have no meaning. They'll hear and understand the same words I used and guess, but they can only guess because they've not done it. So they write that down. Well, that makes sense when I'm trying to explain whatever. Then imagine 2,000 included in this book is that metaphor. It's like spinning a basketball on your finger. But now there's no more game of basketball. There's no basketball in sight. No one would be motivated to do that and don't have a basketball to do it with. And all the people have memorized it though and they're actually using this metaphor to recruit others into a similar belief system. When none of them have spin the basketball on their finger, therefore the real meaning behind that is gone. Whatever Christ said to people when he was talking with them, if that happened, of course would have been in the moment, catered to whoever he was speaking to. In addition, he was able to shape what he said. Remember, the people, if they did write it down, and I don't know how he could talk that fast and have them write it down, but nevertheless, they would take Cliff's notes, you know what I mean? They would have their experience and write it down based upon what he said. But what he said was describing what they were feeling with him. The understanding they got when he was speaking it, in that moment, in that time. So he went 
on using parable after parable, metaphor after metaphor, because you can only bring people to the truth with metaphor. You can't tell them the truth with metaphor like I just explained. So he'll try it again. It's like this and this. It's like this and this and this. To try to tune the mind to an experience that would be close because you know what it's like to ride a bike. So you try to draw upon something they might have done that would assist them that the rules and regulations of control are keeping them from knowing. You work with what you got. That's what metaphors are. An attempt to work with what you've got with understandings that you know exist in the people that you're trying to bring to a different understanding. Does that make sense? The problem is the majority of these used car salesmen everybody calls priests is that they're not qualified to teach you about spirit. You've been told that they are, but they're not. Do you understand that they are practicing occult Satanism, whether they know it or not? Some of them were probably indoctrinated into Catholicism. Others were indoctrinated into Satanism and are posing as Catholic priests. Either way, they're recruiting and manipulating people with it. And if somebody does know about the occult side of it, they're not going to tell you anyway. So you have to know the truth in order to be able to see this. They're not qualified to teach you about spirit. Why? Because even if their intentions are good, they've learned about God from the Bible. And probably at an early age, so it created this rigid filter we call a belief system. Trying to filter everything they experience through this indoctrinated belief system. These people aren't qualified to teach you about spirit any more than somebody's qualified to teach you how to ride a bike who's only read a book about riding a bike and a fraudulent one at that and has never ridden one themselves. They're not qualified. But because the mind control is so stiff and so strong and there's so much fear of the unknown attached to it, the people that desperately want to ride a bike but have been programmed with this would rather kill somebody who can show them how to ride the bike because of the fear and the mind control, which is what happened to Christ. Those people didn't do a thing about it. When you get these high priests that killed him, and they say, well, no, the Romans killed him. The high priest didn't kill him. Yeah, they did. What they did with Christ is no different than what they did with Lee Harvey Oswald. The Romans were the fall guys. They used manipulation and political pressure and sorcery of the mob mentality, fascism existing back then, to put pressure on the Romans to carry out their dirty work. That's what happened. And they can argue it all they want. It's what they do. That's why they argue. That's all they can do is argue. And eventually they can't answer these questions anymore, so they just talk over you. Or, I love this one, you're crazy, you need some therapy. Generally, the people that run the world will come off as the nice ones. Everything they'll say about their group is always going to be, of course, nice. And anybody who says anything against their group is, of course, insane. The implication is they're insane. And, and the group will always be nice about it. You know, I care about you. You seem to be having some mental problems. You might benefit from some therapy. And you create this fraudulent pseudoscience they call it psychology, and you indoctrinate the public into its credibility so that you can draw upon it whenever you are discovered. Because your control is outside of their ability to perceive, it works beautifully. You witness this all the time, whether you know it or not. <laughs> I get a kick out of people thinking the Antichrist is going to be some sort of person with a title. No, it's this collective consciousness I've been telling you about. Anybody who is against the teachings of Christ. What's another way of saying against Christ? Antichrist. 
So, if you know anybody that's even publicly against, does not adhere to, or denies the teachings, not the man, the teachings, they are the Antichrist. Rise of the Antichrist, if I said the Asian flu is on the rise, I'm not talking about one individual virus, I'm talking about the collective strain, including all of the viruses in that strain. Do you understand that? The rise of man, does it mean the rise of one man? So, the Antichrist consciousness and control system here was already there back then. The Antichrist or diseased cancerous consciousness is what murdered him then and it has risen since. And those who are in control of the world are anti-Christ. It's obvious. But I don't talk about who they are at all because I know that if people can't see it for themselves, telling them is useless. Therefore, I try to get you to be able to see the truth first. Like an MD cannot understand disease until they understand how the body works when it's not diseased. Does that make sense to you? If you don't understand normal homeostatic function in the body, how can you possibly interpret what the disease is if you don't know how the body works when it's normal? And it's obvious that nobody can see who it is, so telling them is useless. You have sorcery being practiced on you. You have all kinds of control methods you couldn't even comprehend. My goal is not to attack anybody. My goal is to fix this whole thing. I don't want to get out and escape it because it will still exist. And believe me, if I'm being shown what's going on, that means something larger isn't happy with this situation either. So it's not going anywhere. Look, if you want to know the nature of a priest, just ask them three questions. Go up to a priest and say, Real innocently, you know, just go up to the Catholic priest with his black and white, <clears throat> you know, the dark side of the yin-yang, the yin right? Uh, black and white uniform. Or his robe as he's burning incense. All of these things you're warned about in the Bible. However, mind control works, doesn't it? No Christian is able to put two and two together. Forget about whether they thought of doing it control. They will be unable to see the contradiction because of the fear. This is God's word. How do you control people? Why did they steal the teachings of Christ? Because his truth was so pure and of an understanding they didn't have that it's very alluring. So they had to take his teachings. But imagine this. Say you have 10 statements supposedly by Christ. Okay, make the first seven authentic and then add three more to corrupt it and slip in a rule here and there, some sort of rule about society and you that he didn't say. That's how you do it. And that's what they have done. And you're not going to be able to see what is and what is not until you ride a bike. If you haven't ridden a bike, how can you read a book about riding bikes that is corrupt and be able to see the corruption? If you haven't ridden a bike, you're not going to know what is true and what is not. He was a bike rider trying to get you to ride bikes and they're trying to get you to ride him because they know if you try to ride him, you'll never ride the bike and they got you. Why do you think he said, you'll be forgiven if you deny me, but not the creative spirit? Because he was a temporary manifestation of consciousness. His name and his body don't matter, and he knew that, which is why he let go of it. Why did he keep his mouth shut when they questioned him? A, they didn't want to know the truth, and B, they weren't going to give him two weeks to try to lead him to the truth. Therefore, he couldn't answer the questions. He just kept his mouth shut. 
and he knew they were all under demonic mind control. Forgive them, they know not what they do. Why do you think you didn't know what you were doing? Because people think that demons somehow inject thoughts into your mind. No, your mind is a co-creation of you and foul play, whether it be mind control, a demon, or anything else. It's a co-creation, meaning a demon literally pushes your spirit out of the way, grabs the steering wheel, and uses your mind for its own intentions. In other words, it thinks for you, and the mind can't perceive that from outside of itself. Therefore, whatever it thinks, it thinks it is thinking it. Therefore, the prison of the mind. When you connect to the creative spirit, now, you know, it's so difficult to be precise on this because I don't want people seeking something outside of themselves. The way the creative spirit will interface with you will be with your spirit, which is it, a derivative of it, and then it will rise from within to command your mind. It will never speak directly to your ego. And people say, well, yeah, but you, the way you talk about it, it's like a conversation. No, that's my translation for you of understanding. It is my spirit that is teaching me. Do you understand that? And it gets the influence from something larger. I'm learning from me. When I try to translate it for you, Jonathan, do this, Jonathan, this is how it is. That is a translation into words for what is occurring inside of me. It's the best way I can put it. What is their primary agenda? They absolutely need, require you to feel responsible for whatever they have done to you. Or it just won't work. I'll say that again. They absolutely need you to feel responsible for what they have done to and through you. They need you to be ignorant of the extra dimensional influence because if you're ignorant of that, you will blame everything on yourself. That's how it works. What a scam this is. Create the soul, right? Put you in there, put you in an energy body, and put you in a body. And of course, you will have absolute amnesia the moment you're born. And you're like a programmed character in a Sims game. And you develop your character with each new day and they control the character. What they do is make you default the best they can. Make you defy what you normally would do. And the energy body, which is where your mind is, you see your mind isn't in your brain. Your brain's a conjugate to your mind. It is just a receiver to it. It is larger than your brain accesses. Imagine if you have 500 points of consciousness in your mind and your brain is tuned to access 240 or something like that. Then it's a filter. Do you understand that? It's a filter. It's blinders. And so when you die, they come to you and create an illusion, a reality as real as the one you experience right now and try to slam you quick. They'll come to you in whatever way they need to based upon assessment of your mind. Your mind will be like a hard drive on a computer. They can access all of it right away, instantaneously, and will create the suitable illusion and excuse for your experience. Either you're learning a lesson and your soul is evolving, so you need to do it again, reincarnate again to grow bullshit. Or you have sinned and I'm judging you and I am Jesus and you can either go to hell or you can reincarnate and learn your lesson, bullshit. Or they'll just try to send you directly to a hell-like experience and allow them, law of contract, to torture you because you feel you were judged by God. They do all the shit through you, pervert you, corrupt you, your character, basically, get all the other characters to hate you if possible, and then use what they've done to and through you against you. And with each new life, they break your will until eventually you just give yourself to this cancer consciousness so it can absorb you for itself. Why does it work? Why does it work for these secret societies? A, Satan, if you want to call it that, isn't stupid. 
Remember the discussion of scalar reality from the healing begins now. Very important now for you to understand that. Satan is like a consciousness that is separate, which is like cancer. Therefore, it has scalar growth. And it will see itself as one thing. So, when it seduces and entices and recruits, its reasoning will be very, very close to the reasoning that Christ would have, or the Spirit's reasoning. We are one. I am you, you are me. Very similar to creation, isn't it? Yet, it will have the cancer agenda, right? Hurt other people, that's fine. Just love me. That is the difference. The Spirit has respect and love for all of its creations. Cancer wants you to do whatever you want to that which is not its creation, to destroy it, as long as your allegiance is to the cancer. And once it sucks you in, you're its slave, whether you know it in your current role or not, it knows. So it can be very confusing for a Satanist because it will make a lot of sense. It will mirror a lot of the laws of creation, except for the love and respect for all of the creations. That will be the difference. Greed, materialism, its what it does. There are two oneness campaigns going on simultaneously. One of them is the recruiting by the cancer. We are one. Do you understand that? We're one consciousness. Well, it's not wrong in its current state. That's absolutely true. It certainly does see itself as that way. And that is the phenomenon of the all-seeing eye, or the hive mind. Satan can speak through anybody at any time that it's connected to. So can the spirit, which is the conflict. It's not its fault. It can't be in one thing. It has to be the result of free. For I'm unique to Satan in that I respect it, but I see it as something that has a problem. I understand that it's more intelligent than I am with its collective consciousness that it's using, like a bunch of computers that are all linked together for super processing. Satan's intellectual strength grows with each new soul that it absorbs. Hence the Marilyn Manson lyric, the more you fear us, the stronger we get. You know, it's a growth. Do you understand that? It's growing like a cancer. So I understand that it's over my head and it understands that I understand that. A demon understands that I understand that. Mind controlled agents understand that I understand that. It, you know, it tried to entice me, sure. But I turned it down, but the difference between me to it is that I didn't turn it down out of righteousness. Because righteousness is mechanical. It's a program. For example, I give this example, I think, in one of my recordings of where I was walking in the woods with a styrofoam cup of coffee, right? And I finished the coffee and instead of taking it to a garbage can, I had this intuition to just put it down right on the trail. Now 99.9% .9 of humans with their mechanical mind would look at that. If they saw me do that, they would have their opinion based upon mechanical storage of what they believe to be the correct rules. Oh, he's littering. Or, oh, look at him, he didn't give a shit. Whatever their opinion is, but they won't understand what I was doing. Being connected to the spirit and life, I had an understanding in that moment that by putting that coffee cup down, somebody's going to come by and they're going to pick it up. And when they do so, they're going to feel like they're contributing and it's going to raise the spirit in them. Therefore, their vitality. Well, it turns out I met the person who picked up that cup a couple days later by bringing this up synchronously and she was a Rosicrucian that I've sat in the woods and talked to for long periods of time because she's very rigid in her programming as well. Do you understand that Satanists get the same programming that Christians do? It's just a different programming? Satan either wants you to give yourself to it or sell yourself to it. It doesn't care what your experience is and your illusion. <laughs> Oh, sure, you want seven years anything you want in your dream? Sure, okay. You could do that anyway, but you don't know that, so... Yeah, sign right here. Yeah. Or accept its judgment as God. The Spirit will not judge you. It knows that you can't work without its guidance. Your design is to do that. Therefore, 
If you're disconnected, it knows you're not going to work correctly. Therefore, you must assess this world with truth. You must dismantle your belief systems or be as a child, meaning pre-programming. That's part of what entering heaven as a child means. Pre-indoctrination. You have to be honest with yourself about this world. Let me ask you a question. What sane mind would create something like a mosquito, a tapeworm, a wood tick? There's no reason for that. It doesn't make any sense. Why did it happen? This is a world of both true creation, manifestation out of love, and miscreation, both created by a mind. But if the mind is not commanded by spirit and or love, the larger picture, then it's just math, because the mind is math, and if it doesn't have the correct guidance, then it's only mathematical probability. Do you understand that? Meaning you could take a knife and cut your hand off right now, but you're not doing that, are you? But mathematically, it's probable. Those that are not commanded by spirit or have been taken over by cancer see the world as math. Random calculation of possibility. And it can snowball based upon pain and pleasure. This is why they, what you call the Illuminati, are likely to do something incredibly humanitarian one day and then something incredibly heinous and horrific the next day. Mathematical probability. They see no limits. They want new formulas, new calculations, new colors, new sounds, you know? There are a lot of things that you could do that you don't do. Some of that is because of the programming of your mind. The other element to that is your spirit. Technically, I mean, you shouldn't have to teach a child not to kill. It wouldn't be in their instinct to want to do that because of the guidance of spirit. The spirit is very strong in a child. You get these, and people say, old souls are very wise. No, the real truth is the old souls are the ones that have been here and have been having their will broken over lifetimes. So the old souls are the ones that are just following the system, and they've lost a lot of their ability to perceive the truth. That's why they go right along with the system, because once Satan puts them on that bike, it knows they're going to fall. So it's happy. Yeah, go ahead, go through the system, do whatever. You're not going to be able to withstand the fake judgment or whatever reality we give you when you die anyway. It knows that. That's what building your house in a rock means. You must know thyself. And the only way to know thyself is to know the love of spirit. And once you bear witness to that, it's going to be very, very difficult for Satan to prove to you that you are responsible for anything it did through you, to put you in guilt. The creative spirit loves you. So, every time someone connected to spirit or guided by spirit in a moment lets somebody feel that, which has happened to me a lot, Satan goes to work on them as soon as that interaction is over. And it is very likely they'll get dreamscaped, reprogrammed so that the very next day even, they forgot all about it. They forgot how it made them feel. It's always doing that. It's always trying to counter people that I talk to. Do you know how many people have complained of entity attacks? After listening to what I have to say, yeah. All I can tell you is that don't worry so much about that because that's proof that you're doing something right. Why else would they attack you? It's mathematical probability, miscreation. The mind will create whether it is or is not guided by spirit and or cancer. Cancer is an insane creation, meaning a mind without the guidance of the whole. What is happening on this level is the same thing that happens in your body. There are many ways to look at it. Think of yourself as a cell to something larger. Just like I say that the cells in your body, perhaps they create their own holographic illusion that they experience, so they have an experience while they're alive for you. Well, maybe that's what you're doing. So the cancer in your real state is attached to the outside of you, and the more it breaks your will in your own illusion, the more access it gets to the real you, wherever you are, to come inside and corrupt and change you. So, what you're having right now is an experience. You are not your experience, you are the experiencer. 
Do not let the experience change you. No matter how painful your experience may become or pleasurable it may become, both pain and pleasure are the same as far as Satan is concerned. Pleasure is nothing like the true joy of being commanded by spirit. And I can guarantee you that heaven is anything but boring. You won't be like, uh, all these rules. No, because you will create that. You, you would come to the same conclusion that rules try to impart in this insane reality. If you're honest with yourself, you will see that this world is insane. The whole food chain is insane. What sane mind would create a world where life consumes itself? Well, that's God just subjectively experiencing itself to learn. What? How many times does God have to be a child that gets sacrificed and raped before God gets it? No, that isn't what it is. There's only one truth. And people say, no, truth is individual based upon subjective reality. No, it isn't. But insanity is individual, so congratulations. There's variability in everybody's perception. That should tell you something. Nobody has it right. I'm sitting here right now, and you know it's dark out, and I'm sitting in a nature area to record this. I'm looking at a tree right now. Whatever meaning I'm projecting onto that tree is wrong. And I know that I'll project different meaning than anybody else onto that tree. Therefore, the variability proves that it's not true. So you cannot seek the point of view or vantage point or understanding of God. You can't do that because the mind is incapable of doing that. Therefore, the only way to perceive correctly as the wind picks up here is to stop what you're projecting onto it. Stop doing that Phase cancel out the meaning you think you're applying so that you can see the true meaning. How could you go about that? So you take a walk in the woods and do this, okay? Don't just listen to me and not do it. Do it. And take a nice brisk walk. And as your right foot comes down in your mind, say the word right. As your left foot comes down, say the word wrong. Or good and bad, whatever. Right, wrong, good, bad. Walk fast and say it to yourself. Look down. Discipline your mind. Do this for five minutes straight. Don't look at anything but the ground in front of you and walk. And say, right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong, good, bad, good, bad. And do that for five minutes straight. What you'll be doing is amplifying your binary state. Its peaks of right, wrong, right, wrong. Really bringing them up. And so close together, going back and forth, you'll begin to phase cancel them out. Do that for five minutes, then look up and look at a tree again. And say in your mind, right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong, as you're looking at that tree. Look at a deer, look at a squirrel, and say, right, wrong, right, wrong. If you do this correctly, you will have the opportunity to bear witness to your own insanity. Your own insanity is the mind, which has been isolated in and of itself, which was never the design in creation. Now, the book that's meant to deceive you doesn't tell you that. Well, it does in some ways, but those parables are old and people don't understand them correctly. The only way you can understand the parables given by whoever that man was is to learn them via your spirit in congruence with the spirit. Gain the knowledge so that you can look at the book and see what is true. Meaning, put the book down. It's not going anywhere. Put it down. And don't do it ritualistically through words. I'm going to pray for so-and-so and be the Lord be thy name, blah, blah. That's all ritualistic and wrong. And if you pray like that, you're doing it from the mind and not the heart. And Satan knows that, which is why it wants you to use ritualistic prayer with words. And Christ knew that Satan would do that, which is why he would say, don't mindlessly mouth words. Oh, you must be special to know this. No. Anybody can know this. You just have to drop your fear and ask for it. Intend for it. And you have to let go of whatever you think you believe in order to know the truth. If you're not willing to do that, then you can't know spirit. Because this is an insane world of 
miscreation and creation. It makes no sense. So if you take the walk and do that, it's not that you can seek the meaning, and the meaning you project is wrong as well. Therefore, you have to stop the meaning you're projecting so that the real meaning can be revealed to you. And there is only one meaning when you see that. Love. Equal appreciation, love, and adoration for everything. And that's what Satan doesn't want you to know. That's what demons don't want you to know. They want you concerned about the future. You know, they want you to sit there and brainstorm and not be in the now. And they're strategizing against this because they know this knowledge is going to get out. That's why you would see the movie Love Guru with Mike Myers, right? Comedy is the number one vector for mind control because it puts you in a pleasurable state and you're focused on the joke and therefore they can slip in so many messages and you'll associate their messages with pleasure. They make fun of the idea of being here and now with comedy. Every truth that is true in that movie, they make fun of it as if it's corny and stupid and, uh, you know, that's the whole intent of that movie. You see it as comedy expression of a comedian to get some laughs because you don't know how over your head these movie producers are and what is controlling them if you want to call it Satan Semiramis whatever Isis the serpent it doesn't matter and it recruits them and tells them how much it loves them do you understand that evil is gonna come in the name of love you think it's stupid it's going to come in the name of hate? No! The number one thing that evil will push on you is love and how much it loves you. Just like the guy trying to get sex in a bar, telling the girl how much he loves her and how he'll respect her in the morning. A lot of girls can relate to what I just said because that metaphor has meaning for them. You know, I feel so bad for Satanists in the sense that they're being so duped. Do you realize that a lot of the truth that is used about creation, life, the elements of reality, a lot of that used to solicit them into that religion is also the teachings of Christ? How ironic that they draw upon the teachings of Christ to turn those against Christ by, once again, taking credit for the teachings of that person or anybody else that was connected to spirit. Lilith, right? All the different names for the serpent. Fine, let's call it Lilith. Just love me. Do whatever you want, just love me. And I'll love you back. There is a difference between using psychic manipulation to enhance your feeling of pleasure, the tingly sensation that it uses, that Satan uses, and true love. And the irony is this. A lot of these people that are worshipping Satan with whatever name they choose, with whatever form Satan is using to seduce them, when they feel love, that's the love of God. But because you can't discern that with all of this confusion here, Satan just takes credit for that. Yes, that was my love. It reminds me of, uh, you know, the movie Coming to America, where that Soul Glow guy, <laughs> the guy that's on, that was on ER for a while, that played Soul Glow. Eddie Murphy makes this huge donation to her cause. She didn't know who did it, so she just assumed it was her rich boyfriend. And she just thanked him. Somebody put a large amount of money in the donation box. Assumed it was him and he said, well, I, uh, he took credit for it. <laughs> you think that Satan wouldn't do that? Another movie, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, when Brad Hamilton takes the flowers that he didn't buy and gave them to his girlfriend saying that he did it. How many people do you know take credit for things that they didn't do? People that plagiarize do it all of the time. They don't give credit to whoever they learned it from. They just say it like it's their own idea.
There's an excellent scene in Goodwill Hunting I think I'll put in right now to demonstrate the insanity of plagiarism. Oh, hello. Oh, hello. Hi, how are you? I'm in. So do you ladies... Uh, do I come here? I come here a bit. I'm here, uh, you know, from time to time. Do you go to school here? Yeah. Yeah. So I think I had a class with you. Oh, yeah? What class? History. Maybe? Yes. I think that's what it was. You don't necessarily... I not remember me. You know, I like it here. It doesn't mean because I go here. I'm a genius. I am hey. very smart. Hey, how's it going? How are you? How are you doing? You want it? History. Yeah. Just history? It must have been a survey course then, huh? Yeah, it was. It was surveys. Right. You should check it out. It's a good course. It's a good, be a good class. Oh. How'd you like that course? You know, frankly, I found the class, you know, rather uh, elementary. Elementary. Yeah. You know, I don't doubt that it was. Yeah. I, uh, I remember that class. It was, um, it was just between recess and lunch. Clark, why don't you go away? Why don't you relax? Why do you just go away? I'm just having fun with my new friend, that's all. Wait, you gonna have a problem? No, 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 there's no problem here. I was just hoping you might give me some insight into the evolution of the market economy in the southern colonies. My contention is that uh, prior to the Revolutionary War, the economic modalities, especially in the southern colonies, could most aptly be characterized as agrarian pre capital All right, of course that's your Hang on You're a first-year grad student. You just got finished reading some Moxie historian, Pete Garrison, probably. You're going to be convinced of that till next month when you get to James Lemon. Then you're going to be talking about how the economies of Virginia and Pennsylvania were entrepreneurial and capitalist way back in 1740. That's going to last until next year. You're going to be in here regurgitating Gordon Wood talking about, you know, the pre-revolutionary utopia and the capital forming effects of military mobilization. As a matter of fact, I won't because Wood drastically underestimates the impact Wood of social distinctions. Wood drastically underestimates the impact of social distinctions predicated upon wealth, especially inherited wealth. You got that from Vickers. Work in Essex County, page 98, right? Yeah, I read that too. Were you going to plagiarize the whole thing for us? Do you have any thoughts of, of your own on this matter? Or do you, is that your thing? You come into a bar, you read some obscure passage and then pretend you, you pawn it off as your own... Is your own idea just to impress some girls, embarrass my friend? See, the sad thing about a guy like you is in 50 years, you're going to start doing some thinking on your own, and you're going to come up with the fact that there are two certainties in life. One, don't do that. And two, you dropped 150 grand on a fucking education you could have got for a dollar fifty in late charges at the public library. <laughs> yeah, but I will have a degree, and you'll be serving my kids fries at a drive through on our way to a skiing trip. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Yeah, but at least I won't be unoriginal. Basically, Satan plagiarizes the spirit. To recruit, to entice, to seduce, it plagiarizes the spirit, the creator. So anyway, all its symbols are everywhere. The color blue, the color purple, butterflies, Butterflies are the uh, huge symbol of Satan, the transformation from what you are into what it wants you to be. So it's subconsciously putting that image of metamorphosis out there. Understand that. That's why butterflies are very much associated with porn, porn stars. Catholicism is pure Satanism. The problem is you shouldn't need to be told that. You should be able to see that. Priests that come out and need their audience and admiration in their temple. Why does God need a temple, a building? What? It means nothing. But they get off on that because everybody gives the priest their love. Oh, I gotta be nice to a priest so I get into heaven. They don't give anything back. They just absorb the love, which is what a lot of spiritual, quote, gurus do. They absorb your energy through admiration. That's what they're doing. So the best advice I can give to you is overcome your reality. That doesn't mean numb yourself to this world. It doesn't mean don't appreciate it. To be you, you're going to have to be able to appreciate everything. If you see something that doesn't make sense, rather than getting angry at it, look at it the way a doctor would look at a patient. 
See it for what it is, an accident, a problem. Understand it. The idea that animals need to consume each other and other life here is ridiculous. That's why people that try to do everything right here cannot. But they're conned into thinking this is normal here. You're told right off the bat you're on Earth. How do you know? Why, because other humans tell you that? They've told you that's where you are, that this is life, the food chain is normal, biology says so. How do you know that? You're trusting everything you've been told. If your instinct, which is valid, tells you that doesn't make sense, you're right. Satan controls all of academia, all of the media, all of the money, everything you're told. And a total defense against that is getting you to hate Satan. Satan loves that. Why would Satan love that? Because you're giving it energy. And hate is not of your true nature. Therefore, if it gets you doing that, then you give it energy. An example of someone doing that would be Andy Kaufman, that comedian. A lot of people, they say they're just trying to get attention. Negative or positive is the same. So if you hate this consciousness, call it names and curse it, it has you, it's got you. Know thyself and be thyself. Do not be where you are, be what you are, regardless of where you are. And the only way you'll know what you are is reconnecting to what you are. Which means you're going to have to dismantle the ego somewhat. Not the mind, just the ego. Meaning, what's the proof that a mind is useful here? Well, to make the decisions, to navigate through the illusion. The, the fears of the mind, but spirit overrides that. If you go into your backyard and walk up to a little bird's nest and say that bird has little babies in it, you being 80 times the size of the bird, try it. Try it. Walk up to the bird's nest. That little bird, 180th of your size, will stand up to you. Home of the brave, it'll stand up to you. And more times than not, the human will run, cover their head, and be freaked out. Look how freaked out people get by a little bee. Because see, to protect the babies, it has a natural understanding of the intrinsic value of their lives and its life. But if there were no babies in that nest, the bird would fly. It would flee, proving it was able to make a mental decision. So Satan will try to get you to abandon the mind altogether. Why? Because there is truth in the fraudulent nature of your ego. So it knows that, it knows that truth will come out, so it has to amplify that and exaggerate it beyond usefulness. Get rid of the whole mind! Become a robot! <laughs> or I love this one, the spirituality of love in the form of dissociation, bliss. Don't talk to me so firmly, you're putting me on a negative vibration. What? What if you had a kid that was walking towards a busy street? Didn't know what they were doing, they were walking towards that street and the cars were unaware of the kid. Oh dear, I don't want to put you in a negative vibration, I want to be all of love, but I really need you- BANG! <laughs> no, the moment you see that, your intuition will make you yell. HEY! You'll scare that kid, probably in the moment. But that's better than the kid dying. Negative vibration. Satan coordinates this bullshit New Age movement to get people to dissociate. It's no different than getting drunk. It's detachment from your normal instinct to try to help everybody in this realm. You become concerned with your own bliss. Therefore, you don't speak out against it unless you're speaking out to get other people to detach. Now, you do need to detach from this reality, but while in it, it would help if you try to... Per see, your detachment as you walk in the woods um, and think that you've accomplished something and you think your whole world is of your negative ego, that isn't stopping a little child from being raped today. Your detachment. Part of your responsibility is to get the word out. So Satan knows that. It's very, very clever. People don't get this. There are a lot of Satanists that are online.
are against government. They're against the new world order. They're against all of this control, aren't they? They're talking about the Freemasons. People think, oh, these Satanists are really honest. It's because you're like uh, a chess player that's thinking three moves ahead and you're playing somebody that's able to think 30 moves ahead. So you catch their bishop in five moves and say, ha, I got your bishop. And they say, ha, yeah, I know you did and I knew you would. And in exactly five moves. And then three and a half minutes later, checkmate. The number one subliminal message out there is a circle with an A in it, which stands for anarchy, and an American flag that is torn down the middle. Transparent American flags that are ripped in the longitudinal fashion. Why? And you know where they're most prevalent? You're going to love this. Pornography. Oh, you want to know why you should stay away from pornography? That's the number two vector for mind control, but the strongest effect. Why? If they're loading up your mind, forget about the positive commands to make you love the deviants in porn, but the propaganda commands of anarchy, and you masturbate to that? <laughs> you wire your brain to associate whatever subliminal commands they're putting in your mind to pleasure. Therefore, subconsciously, anarchy equals pleasure. Ding, 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 ding. Stay away from porn. Don't you understand what porn does? Satan loves that too because it gives you an illusion of sexual interaction. There is no sexual interaction. You're watching actors on the screen. <laughs> actors. You're watching people on a screen. And it creates the voyeur mentality of separation. And you actually masturbate and have your orgasm and have had no interaction with a human. And then you wire your brain that way, which is why a lot of married men or men in relationships addicted to porn are impotent. Why? They've wired their brain to want no interaction. In other words, object only. No personality, no value, just object. Which means they could be impotent in their relationship, go cheat on their girlfriend, and be hard as an iron bar. Why? It's programming in the mind to objectify women. That's how it accomplishes that. You don't know how sinister porn is. It has nothing to do with sex being good or bad. It has everything to do with mind control. Anyway, so Satanists are going to promote anarchy. You watch. You don't believe me? You just wait. I guarantee you they'll slip in that word as they're talking about government and how bad it is. Why? Because the people that are putting out this propaganda, the truth movement about 9-11, are the ones that attacked us on 9-11. Why? Don't you know their phrase? Order out of chaos. They want chaos. They don't want you to have a solution. No, no, no. They don't want you to be able to unify. They just want you to rise up like chickens with their heads cut off so that there is chaos or anarchy. Don't think that's possible? Have you ever seen footage of a riot? They want you to rise up. Nobody's solving anything. It's just a bunch of propaganda bullshit about 9-11. People send emails to each other and talk about it all the time, but nobody's doing anything. Exactly. When the right date, day, hour, minute, second it's going to kick off and you're going to have anarchy so that they can bring in foreign troops, most probably China, to quote, restore order out of chaos and attack the United States. To restore order, of course, and then dissolve the border between Canada and Mexico and bring in your wonderful American Union loaded with electronic mind control and all of the trimmings. Hopefully that'll clear up for you why Satanists would appear to be on your side fighting for the freedom of your rights. They're puppets of Satan. Remember, in the name of love, in the name of what's right, that's what they're going to do. Therefore, listening to somebody like me telling you the facts will not help you because if you can't see that for yourself, then telling you will do nothing. It will do nothing for you other than load up that left hemisphere of your brain and accomplish nothing. 
I'm telling you, connect to your spirit inside. Dismantle the ego and intend for that. The love. And then you will see. I didn't read what I'm telling you anywhere. You've got to resist the anarchy, which will be very difficult. But that's what they don't want, is a calm approach to what's happening. That is their worst nightmare. They need chaos for order. These people have a history of pointing their fingers at themselves. They did it when they switched from dictatorship to hidden hand. They're doing it now. They're exposing what's happened on 9-11 through these fake underground truth movements. You know, I got cut off on a radio show that uh, was supposedly people fighting for the truth in this country. The very moment I started talking about mind control, the music came on and I have it on tape. Let me play that for you quick so you can see how fake these movements are. How fake this truth propaganda is. When you touch the truth, you get cut off. Uh, his program, this one is also very interesting, but I see that you're covering uh, more legislation and law, is that right? Yeah, we're, yes. we're covering how to kick public officials behind. What we do is we file criminal charges against public officials who violate law. We're trying to reclaim our court system because everything that they do is unconstitutional in violation of due process and illegal. Our courts are completely out of control and defense attorneys and other attorneys will not keep judges in line because judges will ruin their careers so what all it's up to us the citizens to know the law and to take to task judges and prosecutors and individuals in the court system that's what we do we're out to reclaim our courts this is what we do is the takedown strategy i could give you a very interesting uh, point of view on that if you're willing yes the only, the only thing is though are you open to anything that isn't foul language that you would deem logical yes or sincere in its nature no matter where it takes you in as far as information yeah, we're open to hear it we may not agree but we're sure open to hear it okay <laughs> well this is pretty interesting and and also yes we're open here but i do want to mention that we have a really full board of callers we have like eight callers waiting on the line because we had the call lines closed the first two hours so please for the sake of everyone who's been holding and waiting to call in for two hours can we make it just make it a little bit brief just be considerate of the other callers waiting please sure uh this is going to be weird going fast but uh six months ago i sat down with an ex-fbi agent and he explained the whole thing to me. Would you like me to go further? Yes. Yes. Okay. He left the FBI. <clears throat> Texas, interestingly, is where he was stationed. He uh, told me about two things. One, that he had busted a party. That uh, he was he and a team of people. And this is this isn't a video I watched or some book I read. This is a gentleman looking me right in the eyes. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, with intuition, you can gauge if somebody's being honest with you or not. And there was extreme criminal activity involving sexual practices going on at this party. And he tried to go forward with an investigation. It was pulled. Mm. He transferred to Customs on the East Coast and found out that it was our government bringing in cocaine. And it was at that point that he left the FBI. Mm. Uh, he himself told me to not do anything, to not look into it. He has uh, <clears throat> contacts in the mafia and told me how they described it to him. Uh, he said, you're, you're talking about the judicial system. And the mafia people would say to him, and I'm going as fast as I can, how do you think these judges get elected? He said, well, right. how do you think they get into office? We own you. And that's pretty weird to have an ex-FBI agent tell you that. But uh, that's what we're dealing with. You're dealing with organized crime. Absolutely. Okay. So, okay. And, and so it is, it is a messed up maritime system. You understand that. But it, what it's going to come down to, regardless, when you strip away all the detail, is the resonance of love, which is basically a truth vibration. When people have that, then they can stand up for the truth. If they're disconnected, they'll be binary in their mind, and they will justify why not to be a life form, which is that which expresses love and truth. So 
that is where we got to focus, you know, and, and a lot of it is recharging the spirit of people so they actually feel like they should contribute, that they do have value in and of themselves, and when they can do that, they're more likely to stand up for other people. Absolutely. We are in the same place. Yes. The, the one thing that I try to, try to demonstrate more than any other is sure. that this is not just our right, it's our duty. And in doing this duty, we're not out here to harm anyone. Oh yeah, I file a lot of criminal complaints against public officials. But that's merely a means to a proper end. I have no animosity between, uh, toward these guys. For the most part, I consider the police to be people who want to be good guys. They're just exactly. they're stuck yes. in a garbage system they can't fix. And when we implement these strategies, and when we implement these strategies, we don't do this out of uh, feelings of anger or vengeance or vindication. We do it out of justice and duty. And, and more than that. And I, trying to make things yeah. fair for people. I just I'm going to file about a hundred criminal complaints because of one arrest. I'm going to file against public officials who have no idea what they did wrong. And, and just, I'm going to charge them with following policy. And the reason being is I want to give them plausible deniability. I want them to be able to go to their boss and say, Hey, Bubba, why am I getting in trouble for doing what you told me to do? Well, This is my purpose. It's not to get them in trouble. Can I add something to that? Sure. I think that, you know, with today's technology, it is quite possible to administer what's called rapid belief modification via mind control. Now, that can be used detrimentally, but when we come to a situation like this, the primary problem is the human inability to move on, right. uh, to forgive. And that is what this group, this elite group, is also considering is that if these things come out, can we forgive? Well, now we're in a situation where if somebody wants to point their finger at somebody for committing a crime, we can say, okay, well, let's just take you into this room for two weeks, and we're going to reprogram. Okay, listen, right. yes, seconds. listen, we, we need to go to break. We're going to break in two Four seconds. Empathy. We'll be right back. Anyway, the second thing that's been on my mind, it could very well be that Christianity and a lot of these religions were designed their very purpose thinking this many moves ahead designed to fail how why well if they steal the teachings of Christ and then create this Jesus deity this Trinity which isn't what it was then point their fingers at themselves like they always do expose the Babylonian symbolism the satanic symbolism of the religions they created they could do that in hopes to make you abandon all Christ's teachings as well do you see if you don't know that they stole those teachings then you'll think that they created those teachings they expose the deity as symbolism and then everybody will have their big sigh of relief oh we don't have to be good. We don't have to follow any of that. You see, the ultimate last ditch attempt to discredit Christ. Why? That opens the door for the new world religion of sorcery or Satanism for the utopia. It has to be that because there's no way these people doing what they're doing could have given the metaphors that Christ gave to create some symbolic deity. They just the two wouldn't go hand in hand. So it really the from what I've been learning, what I've seen, they stole his teachings to draw people into both Christianity and Satanism. Then they're gonna point the finger at the symbolism of Christianity and other religions so that people release all of the teachings of Christ thinking it was a fraud for the final entrapment it's very important that you stay balanced because regardless of what's happening in this reality you have got to stay you while you speak out about it all of these things the primary foundation of what you are is love and that's what they don't want you to know 
And the easiest way to do that is to come in the name of love and slowly tear you away from it, redefine it, to ensnare you in the web. One more thing I want to address for people, which has nothing to do with the topic, but I'll add it to this recording, okay? People are kind of getting tongue-tied and gridlocked trying to approach people about what's going on. They're finding it very difficult, as would be predicted, to go up to a stranger and start talking about the New World Order, or even spirit. It is very difficult. So how do you approach people? Well, I've already shown you that. You've got to understand, look, it doesn't matter how fraudulent a person's belief systems are. They're very rigid, regardless. If you try to attack somebody's belief system, even if it has been built off of disinformation, you've got to understand their very personality is built off of the disinformation. So if you attack the disinformation right out of the blue, they're going to feel like their very existence and their personality is under attack. Does that make sense to you? The best way to do this is to show them subliminal messages. It's one thing to do it online, but people can always say, oh, he did that. He put it in there with Adobe Photoshop. It's another thing to do it in person. Now, I recently just took a trip all the way through the south, and I went all over the place. Like in, for example, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, they had this huge mall, and I went in there with the Glamour magazine, November 2007, in hand, and went store to store. So yeah, I'm putting the footwork in. I don't have a lot of money, but I spent my money to do this. Why would I do that? It didn't matter what store. It could be Banana Republic, a hair salon, Foot Locker. It didn't matter who it was. It's real easy to do. Listen, if any of you have the social skills to communicate where you don't come off as intrusive or imposing on people, you're the people that are needed to wake up. Okay? Because then you're going to be able to approach people in a sincere way and feel comfortable doing it. And that's very, very important. So that's something that I have the ability to do and I'm doing it. I walk in, all I say is, hey, you want to see something interesting? Now who doesn't want to see something interesting? <laughs> I'm not going to come and say, you're all under mind control, the new world order. Yeah, they're going to look at me like, what? I'd say, you want to see something interesting? They say, what? I say, well, I'm just doing a little survey on perception. They say, huh. I say, yeah. And then I just give them a very simplistic understanding. I say, imagine, you know, what I'm looking at is how people's minds are shaped, and I want to test you and see how perceptive you are. What are you able to catch? So now people are competitive. They're interested. Then I go through the conscious mind and subconscious mind thing. I say, recall. I say, you know what the subconscious mind is, right? Usually they'll say, yeah, whether they do or not. And say, remember that the subconscious mind is that which the conscious mind will access for the meaning it's going to project onto its reality. And then I say, well, let me just show you something very basic. And then there's a primary manipulative thing on the cover of that magazine where they have that paragraph shaped two huge nines, of course, upside down sixes, correlated with Mariah's breasts. 99, and then underneath that, little. Then underneath that, ways to, read by the subconscious mind, waste, right? to make over your home and it's shaped like a woman in a dress, they put it right next to her. And I ask people, I put the magazine down in front of them, I say, how do you perceive Mariah Carey's body? Usually they say curvy. She's not curvy at all. She's very large, very big boned, okay? But because of that and how they position her on that, people perceive her to have an hourglass figure. Then I show them the paragraph and they're like, oh my God. I say, that's primary, but there's also secondary and tertiary. And I show them the hidden words. I say, imagine with Adobe Photoshop, if I took like a paintbrush function and started writing, but made the ink like 97% transparent. Make them understand, you see, right on the threshold of conscious perception. So that your subconscious mind, which sees everything, will see it. But your conscious mind won't unless you know that it's there or are looking for it. I take a little paper clip so I have a real fine pointing device. And then I show them the word obey and sex and all of that. I show them sex on her face and in various places, and people are like, oh my god. Of course, if it's the first time they see this, it shocks them. And then I show them where there's a paragraph. This is Mariah's new attitude. I say, look, look at this paragraph. 
It's left justified except for the word new. Why would they pull the word new all the way over? And then I show them to line the N up above the UDE in attitude, nude, all the subconscious things. Make them understand that's why they get you all playing crossword puzzles and stuff in the newspaper to condition your mind to see forward, backward, up, down, left, right. Right? So the subconscious will follow suit. But right above that, hidden, is blatantly obvious two words. God, G-O-D, lies, L-I-E-S. Now people, it's one thing to watch an internet video where somebody highlights it for you, but you're not fully trusting it because you don't know whether they did it. It's another thing to do it in person with a magazine they know you didn't make. You see what I'm saying? There is no doubt when you do it in person. There is no way for them to say, you did that. You know, the little minds trying to argue on like, you did that. You're just predicting. You know, they, you're not going to go through any of that. They're in shock, you see. What you've done is you've made them see for themselves, which is irrelevant of their belief system because they can't deny it. And guess what? They want to know why. They're going to want to know why. Sex is all over the page. Seek sex. Satan is good. God lies. They're going to want to know. And because they can see it, that energy has risen. That's when you've got to clearly point them in the right direction. Now they're open to spirit. And that's where you can make sure they understand that these people control religion as well. And this is where you can completely pull someone out of their paradigm. I do it all of the time. I went store to store in many different states. I'm not sitting around on the internet sending emails back and forth. I'm going out there in the public. And the best way to approach them is to show them how their mind is being circumvented and the messages that are being used. Just last night, you know, I went to a gas station's a good place to do it. I showed a girl two days ago, and the next day I came in, she said, well, what can you see on this new magazine? There was a new Glimmer magazine. I said, oh, okay. Well, I grabbed it and looked, and within 20 seconds, 666 is right on her nose, but spelled out S-I-X. I mean, blatantly, on the, on the July issue of Glimmer magazine, right in the bridge of her nose is clearly S. I with a dot over it, X, and then six is underneath it and underneath that. And she's like, oh my God, because you know what I'm saying? I can grab any magazine and do it. That's very important. And then everybody that came into the gas station said, excuse me, both males and females of all different personality types, every single one of them saw it. Some people came in and I showed them that, and then I made them understand that that's happening. People would be like, wow, thanks for opening my eyes to that. 15 seconds of my time. Why? Hundredth monkey. Hundredth monkey. Get it up there into the collective subconscious. Every attempt helps. So the people know what's going on. For example, I went into this restaurant called Noodles and Company. I was sitting there waiting for my food. They had this big poster with asparagus on it. This big piece of asparagus. Right? Uh-huh. Phallus. I'm like, Oh, I'm sure the word sex is on there, and I looked at it, about four or five seconds, there it was, transparently written, I went up and made sure it was there, then I called one of the employees over, I quickly told her about the conscious, subconscious mind, I told her about Adobe Photoshop, and imagine writing something very transparent, I said, there's a word right here, and I pointed to it, but I didn't tell her what it was, I just said the words there, and then she did the typical reaction, oh my god, yeah, What's the word? Oh, sex? See, not projection, people. This is why doing it in person is so incredibly important. The online videos are a teaching tool, but you've got to be able to do it in person or you're not going to be effective. Next thing I know, a whole crowd of people around me and their belief systems kicked in. All oh, those advertisers. I said, advertising? Advertising? This is a public restaurant. See that kid over there? You think that kid can read? Yeah, do you know your subconscious mind sees everything? Advertising? I have a handout for this insurance company. 
It has this picture of a statue on it. And they just edited into the statue the word flag subconsciously, transparently, and then the ripped American flag. Do you understand what I'm telling you? This is a worldwide effort of the secret societies under the control of this cancerous consciousness that people often refer to as Satan. It's not a joke. So, anyway, you're not going to be able to convince people to break out of their mold unless they have good reason. Seeing how they're being incredibly manipulated, even though the subliminal messages are bare minimum, that's enough. It's enough to spark their interest. Believe me, they're going to want to know why. And you've got to be able to do it in person. That's why you've got to tune your mind. The best way to see subliminal messages clearly is to stop projection. Meaning, don't project any meaning onto it. Don't look for the word sex. Stop your mind, and then what you see will blow you away. Don't expect a word. Just allow yourself to perceive what is there. Most people always keep their eyes moving. Imagine, I mean, think about it. When you're looking at a painting, you're not looking at one fixed point where the negative image starts to form. So you're always looking around the image. And you're not allowing for secondary and tertiary segregation of signal, of image. Look in one point, blank your mind, and allow patterns to come out. That's how you do it. Once you learn to do it, like playing guitar, you get better at it. So good that you can go into any situation, grab a piece of literature, and within minutes you can find something that you can use to show people and they will see it. And that's very powerful because they're not going to be like, you did.